Uh, welcome back to this series of online lectures in my Introduction to Philosophy course. This week we're going to be looking at Socrates and the Socratic turn. So this is following up on our discussion of the pre-Socratics next week and getting ready for our discussion of Plato. Now before I actually go into the lecture, I want to spend just a moment trying to make something clear uh, before we begin. Now Socrates was an actual historical person and he lives from roughly the year 469 before year 1 and he's executed in the year 399 and we'll talk about that as we go through this. But so we know the date that he actually lived. Unfortunately, Socrates is one of these characters in history who never writes anything of his own. So, in fact, uh, we have reports that Socrates was anti-writing and he argued that uh, once you write something down, you no longer need to remember it. So, your memory, therefore, will become worse if you depend on these external devices instead of using one's own memory to store things. And this is important for Socrates, uh, that we keep the oral tradition alive and not diminish our memories by using writing. So he has reasons for resisting writing. It's not the case that he simply refuses to write things down or for instance, is ignorant of how to write. So uh, uh, that clouds the issues because we have no direct evidence of what Socrates himself thought. Instead, what we have are other historical sources which depict aspects of the character of Socrates. He was evidently a very well-known figure in Athens at this time, and his life has been uh, examined over and over again. So chief among these is Plato, and we'll talk about Plato's views more particularly in the next lecture, but it's important to stop here and make this kind of clarificatory remarks. Plato was the student of Socrates and w wrote many dialogues in which Socrates features as the main character. And these more than likely would have been written after the death of the historical Socrates. Now Plato also wrote essays uh, but those have become lost to us through history. So even though they are mentioned in other places, we don't have actually any of the texts themselves. So though we might find reference to some treatise of Plato on this topic or that topic, we don't have that anymore. What we have are these dialogues which were written for popular audiences and they usually depict a famous conversation between Socrates and some other pre-Socratics or some of his followers. So for instance in one famous dialogue, The Republic, we find at the beginning a very famous discussion about what the nature of justice is where Socrates is the main character character. Now, uh, it's not really clear which of these dialogues are supposed to represent the actual historical Socrates and which of these dialogues represent Plato's own developed views where he's using Socrates as a character, uh, as a way of praying, paying tribute to his teacher. He's using Socrates as a, a sort of mouthpiece for his own views. And scholars debate this, saying, uh, well, these dialogues represent Socrates and those dialogues represent Plato's own thoughts and here's a mix of them. Some, some authors just forego this and attribute all of this stuff to Plato and call this Plato, Plato's philosophy. Uh, so there's a big dispute about what the right way to characterize what we know about Socrates um, and, and what is actually attributed to him. Now, when I was learning this stuff, uh, and people have moved past this, it seems, but the, what, the way we thought about this when I was in graduate school way back in the dinosaur ages was that you could kind of tell by looking at the individual dialogues and trying to figure out what the psychology of the Socrates character was. So there's one set of dialogues where the Socrates character ends the conversation in uh, where things are up in the air. Socrates never claims to have any knowledge. He's always seeking after it. And we'll talk more about that um, in just a moment. But there's a, a kind of unsettled ending at the end of the discussion where they simply have identified a, a problem and are not very clear about the way to solve that problem. Whereas later what you find in other dialogues is a very different kind of Socrates. This kind of Socrates is one that has an answer and he wants to tell you about the theory that he's developed. So 
it was argued famously uh, that the first kind of Socrates is the historical person, and the second kind of Socrates is the um, um, Plato's version where he's developing his own views. And that's not hard and fast, and people disagree, as I've said already, but that's roughly the way that we'll be presenting the material. And even if it isn't historically accurate, one thing we can say for this way of doing it is it's organized much of the discussion about this topic. So it's in, this is sort of from our period what we have taken the main way of doing this is. And so I think it's worth knowing even if scholars are currently debating whether or not it's correct. So we will in general stick to this kind of view that we can determine the historical Socrates. And most interestingly, this really is most typified in the book The, Re the Republic, one of uh, Plato's famous dialogues. So chapter one of The Republic, as I mentioned previously, has a discussion about the nature of justice. And chapter one ends where things are very unsettled and there's a particular dialogue, uh, discussion with a sophist named Thrasymachus. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a discussion with a sophist named Thrasymachus and the discussion ends very up in the air. Thrasymachus storms away and says, I don't know what's going on here. I'm right, but I don't know how to prove it. And we won't really look at that discussion here, but I think that that's an indication of the thing I was talking about previously of the kind of actual figure that historic, historically Socrates might have been. So then in book two of the Republic, you find the other character of Socrates. He's got a theory about how to answer the problems which were raised in the first part, of uh, first chapter of the book. And he presents um, a certain theory as the solution to this problem. And so that's the way we're going to be viewing the relationship between Socrates and Plato. Socrates is coming along and setting up a lot of these problems, but not really offering a lot of positive insight into how you could solve these problems, but yet maintaining that there are solutions. And then we'll see Plato is coming along and trying to offer an actual theory about how you could develop these ideas of his teacher Socrates. Okay, so with that grain of salt in mind, keeping uh, very clear that this is kind of a, a recreation of something that's very controversial, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So on this way of thinking about Socrates, he's not interested in questions about the nature of reality. So there's a very famous uh, uh, part of a dialogue where Socrates is telling his audience about the time he came into contact with what we've been calling the pre-Socratic philosophers. So in particular, he had heard about a philosopher whom we did not talk about, a philosopher named Anaxagoras. And he, this Anaxagoras person, had distinguished himself amongst the pre-Socratics as claiming that it was mind which was the ultimate cause and structure, uh, basic element out of which everything else was made. So that uh, what they called nous in the um, Greek, as opposed to water or fire or a pyrion as these other um, uh, pre-Socratics had, had hypothesized. So here's Anaxagoras and he says it's mind. And the young Socrates reports that he's very taken with this idea that mind somehow orders the universe and that it might even be the fundamental basic principle out of which everything else comes. So he goes to question Anaxagoras. He goes to listen to him, read a book, and he asks him questions. And Socrates reports that he's disappointed with the kind of answers that are given by these followers of Anaxagoras. They see mind as merely another mechanical principle, not so much different than fire or water, but they don't see what Socrates thought was important was looking for the explanation of things in terms of their purpose. Why were they built? So what is going to be called their telos or function. Uh, he doesn't find that kind of explanation there and he's dissatisfied. He wants to know the answers to a different set of questions. So as a, to, as a way to make this more precise, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about what kinds of questions he had in mind when he says he's interested in the state of one's soul. So for instance, um, he's interested in the question, what is courage? Socrates was a soldier. He distinguished himself in battle. There's a very famous account, uh, not from Plato as I recall, but uh, 
from another source where uh, Socrates was a soldier in uh, in a war and he saved his friend by running into the his friend was wounded in the middle of a battlefield and Socrates runs out throws him over his shoulders and carries him back to safety and this would have been very dangerous as you could per perhaps imagine uh, put yourself in the position of a person who's fighting in a war like they did in those days where you are hand-to-hand -hand combat with swords and pikes and those kinds of things and when you throw a person over your shoulder you can't really use a sword or a shield and defend yourself in the normal manner so you'd be running across this battlefield virtually exposed to any kind of danger and that's of course why they commended Socrates for courage and for bravery for risking his life but instead of accepting this at face value Socrates begins to use this as an opportunity to ask questions about what courage is what does it mean to be courageous uh, how do we understand that concept so another question he was deeply interested in is the question of what it means to be a good person and we'll see that this is a sort of overarching concern that Socrates had the typical Athenian would have found the answer to be very obvious a good person is one who lives in their society performs well uh, is serving the state and providing for their family and etc so a good person is someone who has the virtues as identified by the society whereas Socrates seems to want to answer this question in a very different way and we'll look briefly at a couple of uh, the ways in which he wants to give a different answer to this but right now I'm just trying to give you the flavor of the way he's interests run contrary to the interest of the pre-Socratics as we've been understanding them. So again, the question, what is justice? Uh, it would have been very commonly held the Homeric notion of justice was correct, which simply is the idea that you owe, you give people what you owe to them, and then you distinguish between your countrymen, citizens, uh, from where from where you are, and other persons. So your enemies, you owe to them a knife in the gut. You don't owe them gratitude. You owe them what you owe an enemy. What to your friend, of course, you don't owe that to them. You owe something else. So there would have been a very definite idea of what was just in these areas, and they would have been exemplified in the in the um, the Homeric and uh, mythology of the time. But uh, Socrates wants to give a different answer, but he's challenging these notions. And here's one that we'll look at as illustrative of these other ones. We'll look very carefully at a dialogue called the Euthyphro, which is where Socrates is having a discussion with a young priest whose name is Euthyphro. So the topic of that discussion is what does it mean to be pious? where that's a religious concept that um, has something to do with keeping being religious in the right way. Uh, be, I don't want to try to precisely define it because that will in fact be the point of the of the dialogue, but we'll be also reading it as a larger, uh, as a stand-in for a larger question, which is what is the nature of moral properties? So uh, we can ask what is goodness, what is badness, and this is something that Socrates um, is very interested in but notice that this set of questions is is distinct extremely distinct from the set of questions that the pre-socratic philosophers philosophers were interested in he's not concerned so much with questions about uh, what the fundamental stuff is is it air is it water he's interested more in the state of one's own soul so what does it mean uh, I'll give you some examples but it's also important to be clear on what the average Greek person would have meant by the word that they're using which we translate as soul so at this time in the history it's thought that what the word actually used at the time meant was simply the differentiating quality between things which were living and things which were non-living. So soul in the first instance, um, as used in ancient Greece, shouldn't be thought of as naming some kind of uh, spiritual or mystic thing, but rather simply as whatever it is that accounts for the difference between you and the dog on one hand and a rock and water on the other hand. So clearly there's a difference dogs are alive people are alive plants are alive rocks are not alive there must be something which explains what that difference is and the common conception would have been that it's the soul living things have souls non-living things lack souls <laughs>
Now, there was a lot of debate over what the exact metaphysical nature of the soul was. So some of the pre-Socratic philosophers were physicalists. They thought that, well, the soul was a physical thing, and you could probably guess that Democritus would be one of these persons. He claimed that the soul was a kind of atom, a spherical in shape. The only thing that distinguished soul atoms from other atoms was their peculiar spherical, cylindrical, uh, I mean, sort of uh, a crescent mooned shape. So that would have been the only difference in essence between them and other kinds of atoms would be in this kind of shape. So you could have those which were physicalists about the soul. You had those which are dualist about the soul. And we'll see Socrates himself is someone who thinks that the the soul is non-physical and survives the death of the body. And that's a very famous doctrine that Socrates argues for in one of the early dialogues. So saying there's a soul is just saying that the thing is alive. So that there's nothing religious. There's no connotation with the word that we have. And in fact, more likely than not, what they think typically identifies something as living involves capacities for thought, sensation, and independent movement. So that we can more generally think of what they call soul as what we would call mind. Uh, but it, they don't line up exactly, but that's where our concept would be closest to the one that they're talking about. Now, to give you some idea of what Socrates is doing here, he claimed that the soul was non-physical and that it was eternal, that it could not be created or destru destroyed, that it, as a non-physical item, it, had, uh, it was impervious to any kind of change. Now, he gives several arguments for this, and we'll learn that they're given in an interesting situation. Namely, they're given in the context of his awaiting his own execution uh, in the dialogue uh, that we're talking about here, the Phaedo, which we won't pay too much attention to, but we'll um, mention this much of it at least. So as he's awaiting his own execution, his friends are wondering if he's scared if, to die and etc. And he's depicted as giving this argument for the immortality of the soul. So he's not afraid to die because he thinks the soul cannot be killed, only his body can be killed. So the one argument that he gives is kind of interesting. He starts from the conception of the soul as the essence of life. Now notice that would have just followed from the average Greek person's conception of what a soul was. The soul was the thing which made something be alive. And when you lacked it, you weren't living. So if the soul is, as commonly thought, the essence of life, then that thing can never die because that would be to admit that its opposite, death, could be instantiated in the soul. So if the soul came to die, then it itself would have to have the property of being dead. But that would mean that the essence of life was dead. And that can't be because the essence of life can only be the essence of life. Now notice what's going on here. And I don't want to dwell too much on this argument, although it is interesting. But the point I want to make here is that he's invoking a principle which the pre-Socratic philosophers at large would have already accepted. So we can view Socrates as being continuous with these pre-Socratic pre 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 philosophers in the sense that he's adopting the use of reason, these basic axioms which you might find as characterizing what geometers do, namely that opposites can exist at the same place at the same time. And he's trying to show that we can apply this to another area. Namely, if we wanted to know whether or not the soul was immortal, whether or not we survive our death, then we can use these methods which these philosophers had developed to answer these kinds of questions. Now, of course, the way he's doing it is very different. He's not writing a treatise. He's having a discussion. Um, and we'll see that there are other differences still. But the basic idea is that Socrates counts as a philosopher according to this idea that we've been developing over the course of these lectures. He is someone who believes that there are certain truths which are discoverable by reason and that we can know various facts about reality by carefully reasoning about these things. But he couples this with other views 
uh, namely that the average person doesn't usually do this. The average person doesn't engage in this kind of self-reflection. The average person is more interested with fame, wealth, and honor than they are with the development of their own moral virtue or with finding out what the truth is about these questions. And that's really what characterizes Socrates is that an, a, a, a deep desire to get to the bottom of questions about the nature of one's self. So we can say that this is the first time that the human mind comes to be the target of philosophical inquiry. And this is generally known as the Socratic turn. It's a metaphor for Socrates turning away from questions about nature and taking up questions about what we would call ethics or moral psychology. What is it that's going on in us? What is the nature of our minds? What is the nature of ourselves, ourselves and the things which make us human? As opposed to asking questions about what is the nature of the table? And very interestingly, some scholars have compared this stage to the stage of development in a child growing up. So if you think about a child, when they first come into the world, they're very focused on things outside of them. They're focused on, what's that? Can I put it in my mouth? What's that? What does it look like? What does it taste like? Getting a feel for the world outside of them. But of course, at a certain point, the child comes to notice itself as an object in the world and it begins to ask questions about itself as distinguished from other things. And you can sort of see Socrates as initiating this phase in the, in the development of human thinking about themselves, in the development of philosophy. It's this time when we've developed what we think is an interesting method, rational deconstruction of the world, reverse engineering of the rational principles which govern reality, and now we have a couple of axioms which we can use to investigate the nature of that reality. And Socrates points out we can do that also to ourselves. We can understand ourselves better. And he adds to that that you're not really living unless you engage in this kind of philosophical, critical self-analysis. And so as we'll see, a large part of what Socrates does is to try to initiate this mode of thinking in his fellow citizens. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Um, well, let me give you some examples. Now, one thing that Socrates very famously argued is that no one knowingly does evil. Now, it takes a second to really try to figure out what that might mean. And there are a couple different things that it might mean to say that no one knowingly does evil. But one thing that people have taken this to mean is that evil actions are ones which are done out of ignorance of what is really right and that if the person had known what was really right, they would not have performed the evil action. So on this view, performing an evil action, like breaking a promise, stealing some money, committing a murder, any of these actions, if a person had known that it was really wrong, then they wouldn't have done it. So what's generally thought is that what Socrates is working with here is a view of human beings as being generally, excuse me, genuinely interested in doing what's right. That human beings are at nature, by nature, at bottom, good. And they always aim towards what is morally good. But because of ignorance about what moral goodness is, persons are often misled into thinking that something immoral is in fact good. And this is a theme that we'll see Plato develop more fully. The idea behind Socrates' view here is that moral properties are objective, that we can say that some things are right and that some things are wrong, objectively right and objectively wrong not merely relative to a person, their interest, or their culture. So that there are objective facts about what counts as beautiful for Socrates and Plato. There are, there are objective facts about what counts as good, aesthetically pleasing, and etc. Um, and we as people want to seek the good in the way that a moth will seek out a flame. We're drawn to it, 
But because it's hard to understand what real goodness is, we often confuse ourselves. So now a lot of people think that this is a very naive view. How could you really think that people never knowingly do what's wrong? I mean, really, just think about it. People say, oh, you know, uh, I shouldn't have stole that money from my roommate, but I needed to get this bus ticket, and that was the only way I could do it. And, you know, I know it's wrong, but that's what I had to do. Now, notice, though, that this is really supporting the point that Socrates wants to make. Here we have a person who's doing something which we all sort of think of as wrong, stealing money from their roommate. But when they start saying it, they start giving a justification for why, even though it's kind of wrong, they, they had to do it, right? Of course, it's wrong to steal, but I needed the money. There was nothing else I could have done. And it's that point that Socrates is making. Each person really has told themselves a story whereby it's okay for them to do what they're doing so that no person wants to say, yes, I know it's wrong and I don't have any excuses, but I'm going to do it anyway. That they're somehow connected into our idea of what it means to be right and wrong. That if you understand that it's right, you want to do it. And this starts a huge debate in philosophical ethics. Is it really the case that A, persons are at bottom good, that they really want to do what's right? And also, is it really true that there's this conceptual connection between knowing that something is right and then performing that action? As we'll see later, uh, Plato develops these ideas and Aristotle really doesn't like them. Now, these would be questions that you would deal with more fully in an ethics class, but you can't help but talk about these issues when you talk about Socrates because these are the kinds of questions which he focuses on. So continuing then again, um, we have another example here where Socrates wants to argue that there are real objective moral properties. And so one way of doing that is to try to show that there's something wrong in the more traditional view, which many people would have held at this time. And in fact, many people still hold at our time, which is that justice is simply whatever the strong people decide that it is and that there are no real rules in the natural world except the ones that strong people impose on weaker persons. So this is the view that Thrasymachus defends in the first book of the Republic, which I mentioned earlier. And it's something which I have sometimes uh, else in other lectures called the morality is for suckers view. So on this view, morality is, well, for suckers. It's a system of rules which are made up by strong people as a way of getting you to focus on their interests instead of your own interests. And so that justice is simply whatever the stronger party says that it is. But of course you would be a fool if you didn't break one of those rules when you could get away with it. So that the self-interested person realizes that these rules which we call morality are imposed on us by stronger persons and the smart person follows them when they have to, but every chance they get, they're breaking these rules to promote their own interest. And Socrates is very against this view and uh, is depicted in the first book of the Republic as offering an argument against it. And we can't really go into the details of it, but it is interesting to point out that what he ultimately does to Thrasymachus is to get Thrasymachus to admit that on his definition, namely that justice is in the interest of the stronger party, on his definition, some particular actions will come out as both just and also unjust. And this famously particularly happens when the ruling class makes laws which are not in fact in their interest because of some error on their part. So if the ruling class makes a law which they think is in their own interest, and they impose it on the society, then it is right for the society to do it. That's what the law says. But at the same time, this thing does not actually promote the interest of the rulers. And therefore, there's a contradiction. According to the theory, the action is both just and unjust. I guess it should be unjust. <laughs> I should be thinking in English. Okay, so I won't dwell on this here, but if you read the first book of the Republic, you can find this argument. As I said, we'll be focusing more on the euthyphro, 
which is this kind of master argument for the existence of moral properties, but just to give you the idea of the kinds of things that Socrates was interested in, and also to point out, again, this common theme, that he really is a philosopher in the sense that we've been developing, namely, that he's relying on this basic axiom about opposites not existing at the same place at the same time. It's just that he's applied it to a new topic matter, and that's really the subject of the turn. The Socratic turn is him taking this methodology, which these earlier pre-Socratic philosophers had developed, and using it on a different set of questions, one that are more relevant to the day-to-day -day lives of human beings. Okay, so here's another one of these sayings. So often what we get from Socrates is not an argument, although there are some, but mostly what we get are sayings, expressions, which Plato develops later and gives actual arguments and theoretical considerations for. So here's another one. Socrates is famous at his own trial for saying that the unexamined life is not worth living. And this is something which I've mentioned previously already. Socrates thought that the point of philosophy shouldn't be really in the first instance to discover the nature of tables and chairs, but should in the first instance be considered with these questions which we've been asking and thinking about, about what the best way to live is, how one ought to conduct oneself, and whether the mind is eternal or perishes at death. These are the questions which matter, and these are the questions which we should be asking. And we want as much as possible to have beliefs which correctly mirror the way reality is. And we can't do that. We can't achieve that goal unless we critically examine our beliefs. So Socrates has in the background this picture that we're all aiming for what the good is, that we have as this as our goal, as our purpose. This is again an illustration of his dissatisfaction with the pre-Socratic way of thinking they weren't thinking in terms of purposes in terms of goals so what we're interested in is achieving this knowledge of the good of what really is objectively good in the world and until we do that we're not gonna live lives which are happy we may think that we're happy but we won't really be happy and this again is another theme or one we'll touch on shortly so that if you're not trying to figure out whether your beliefs track the true, what's real, if instead you merely accept what's told to you and believe it without questioning it, then you're not living a life which is fully engaged. And Socrates compares this to sleepwalking through life. You're not engaging with your beliefs, even ones you hold very deeply. And this attitude is often taken as sort of symbolic of what the philosopher is up to. So Socrates is is considered the prototypical philosopher in this sense. He is someone who wants to make sure that their beliefs are in fact true. That he's not merely accepting things which are told by history, by convention, by his parents, by a society, but is instead interacting with each belief, asking what is the answer to this question? What does it mean to be courageous? Sure, the society says I'm courageous because I did these actions, but what is the true nature of courage such that my actions count as examples of it? And we'll see again when we get to the Euthyphro, this theme becomes manifest. Okay, so again, I hinted at this just a second ago, but it's becoming very clear that so one of the claims that Socrates wants to make is that it's always better to suffer an injustice than to commit one. And that would have been a very controversial claim and goes along with Socrates' uh, earlier claim, which I mentioned, that you may think you're happy, but in reality, you might not really be. So, for instance, take a person who has fame and wealth. They're living at the top of the biggest hill in town in a giant mansion. Everybody looks up to them, you can see them up there driving the big chariots, having all of the women, having all of the men, having whatever they want, money, fame, power, and etc. But if they committed immoral actions in order to achieve that status, Socrates thought, then they weren't truly happy. And he often develops an analogy with health. So there's an idea that a healthy body is one that's functioning appropriately.
one where all the parts are working in the way that they're supposed to be working. And Socrates hints at a similar idea for the soul. A healthy soul is one that's functioning in the right way, one where all the parts are working in the right way. And when you commit immoral actions, you show evidence of a soul which is out of proportion in some way. And so there's an analogy. Just like a person with a disfigured body can't live their best life, if you're born with no arms and no legs, you will be unable to live your best life. Not to say your life isn't worth living. That's controversial. But it should be obvious that you can't live the best possible life that you could have lived given a healthy human body. So too, a person with a disfigured soul, according to Socrates, can't live their best life because the more important part of them, the soul, is disfigured. So it's always better to be the person who's committing the just act, and it's always better to receive an injustice. In fact, Socrates makes the stronger claim that an unjust person can never harm a truly just person. In fact, that person would always be harming themselves because they are disfiguring their soul, even if they take away the just person's life. And that's a bit of foreshadowing. So Socrates wants to claim that, look, even if you kill me, you can't do me any harm because you're acting unjustly. And so actually you're harming yourself. By killing me, you're actually harming yourself. Whereas for, for Socrates, who thinks the soul is immortal, you're not doing him any harm at all. He's lived according to his standards. So this gives you a kind of portrait of a person who has very atypical views and who also is very smart in using reason to try to show that these views are correct. Okay, so now before we actually talk about the euthyphro, and we're uh, gonna go through the basic arguments of the euthyphro as a way of illustrating all of these themes which I've been talking about. So I want to give you some brief review of the story of the so Socratic life, of the life of Socrates. So what I've been telling you so far are about little snippets here and there about his, uh, his philosophical views or his temperament. But now I want to give you some idea of what actually happened over the course of his life. So I've already mentioned some of the details, uh, but a little bit of his character will be useful to know. So Socrates was uh, notoriously not attractive. He's described as having bug eyes and a snout nose, um, sort of eyes looking off in either direction, and sort of big lips. So he was, and of course in a Greek society, much like our contemporary society, they were very focused on physical beauty. And the, we know what they thought was beautiful because they left statues and pictures of the Greek gods. And so they would have thought chiseled features and et cetera, much um, standard similar to ours in many ways, our current contemporary ones. So Socrates did not meet those standards. He was notoriously unattractive. He was... Um, didn't hold a job. He wouldn't take a shower. He wore the same clothes to bed as he wore out on the street. He spent all of his time in the market, what was called the Agora, and would talk to anybody who would pass by. So remember the sophists that we discussed in the earlier lectures. Sophists were people who would only teach for money and people would try to offer money to Socrates to teach them, and he would refuse money. He would not be paid for engaging in philosophical discussion. He wanted to find people and to figure out whether they really knew what they were talking about. So often what he would do is he would be in the marketplace. He would overhear a conversation. Somebody would say, well, that's not just. Why would he act that way? And Socrates would ask them, well, so you think you know what justice is? Well, yeah, I think I know what justice is. Well, then tell me what justice is. And so he would get into these kinds of conversations with anybody who happened to be around. And Socrates was well known for being extremely intelligent, although strange. And his conversations would draw crowds often, especially when the person he was talking to was well known. And you would want to see this because there's Socrates, a disheveled, disheveled mess debating some important person and running circles around them, ultimately getting this person to the point where they would have to admit in public in front of a bunch of people that they really no longer knew the answer to the question. So if the question was, what is justice? Socrates would often argue the person until they got the, to the point where they said, I don't know what justice is anymore. And then Socrates thought, ah, now we can begin. And what he would try to do is, 
is to draw out of the person the answer. And so one of Socrates' favorite methods was to claim that he, in fact, did not know anything. He would claim, I don't know anything. You say that you know something. Why don't you tell me what you know? And then he would proceed to show them that they couldn't possibly mean that, that it was wrong in this way and that way. And then they would say, well, I don't know anymore. And then Socrates would say, ah, well, like a midwife, now I can help you give birth to what you knew all along, but was misguided by this. And this is a theme again that Plato will develop, that knowledge is somehow innate. This is what's known as the doctrine of recollection, that you're not really, when you learn something, you're not really acquiring some new information, but are remembering something that you already knew. And there's a famous dialogue of Socrates where he takes an average person, a slave boy, and by slave, you should really just think to yourself, an uneducated person, a servant, someone who had never been taught geometry, didn't know how to read or write. And Socrates was able to show that if you ask the right questions, the student would give the right answers, which show that he did understand geometry, even though no one had really explained or taught it to him previously. Now, this is supposed to illustrate this basic idea that we have this prior knowledge, which somehow we're born with, and that what we're trying to do is unearth that by careful reflection. Now, this becomes a very influential idea, and we'll see Descartes take up this idea, and Plato take up this idea. Um, so it's interesting that it starts here. Okay, so here's Socrates saying that he doesn't know anything, going around, having these conversations with people, trying to show them that they don't know anything either, and then trying to build back up. Maybe we can develop some of this knowledge. So very famously then, the Oracle at Delphi, which I've meet, mentioned previously in the first lecture, uh, his um, <clears throat> issues a proclamation about Socrates. Someone goes and asks the Oracle, who is the wisest person in Athens? And the Oracle famously responds that it's Socrates, that Socrates is the wisest person in Athens. And this is supposed to be ironic because Socrates is famous for saying that he doesn't know anything. So Socrates jokes, maybe this is what the gods think of human wisdom, that the one who doesn't know anything is, yeah, but that's what human, that's what humanism is. They're not capable of it in other sense. I mean, maybe this is an indication of this, what I've been calling the pre-philosophical way of thinking as evidenced by the oracle. Humans, humans aren't capable of this kind of knowledge. But Socrates, Socrates takes, takes a different line. line. He says, well, I should test. test. Maybe I, maybe I should test, test this. this. And he uses it use as, as an excuse. Or, or maybe it's not, it's not we, don't know, we don't know. But he uses, but he uses this in his, in his question, question of every person, person around, him. around him. So, so when someone says, why do you do this all the time? Socrates will respond. respond. Because the oracle, the oracle has told me that, that, that I, I must. I must, I must go, around go around to every person and see whether or not I am wiser than them. And he's also famous for remarking that even though he doesn't know anything, he thinks that he's discovered in the course of all of these discussions, that even though he doesn't know anything, at least he is aware, <clears throat> excuse me, at least he is aware that he doesn't know anything, whereas other people don't know anything, and yet are under the impression that they do know something. So in that sense, Socrates is better off, he is wiser, because he knows that he does not know. And that's sort of the official conclusion that Socrates comes to is that, well, these other people don't know that they don't know, whereas I do know that I don't know. So maybe that's what the oracle meant. But notice in the course of this investigation, what Socrates has done is to go to all the most powerful and influential people in and around Athens and to have public debates with them and to show them in public that they don't know what they're talking about. Socrates develops many enemies this way, as you could imagine. This is a time when, before John Stewart, this is a time before the, the Daily Show, this is a time where public humiliation was taken very seriously, and often interlocutors of Socrates were made to be filled were made to feel humiliated. They felt like Socrates got the best of them somehow, even though they weren't quite sure in which way. So this made a lot of hard feelings. And Socrates was brought up on charges. The charges, by wide agreement in the society, were trumped up. They just sort of evinced the frustration that the culture had with this character. So the charges officially were corrupting the youth, 
and you can see why they might charge him with corrupting the youth. Socrates is out in the marketplace arguing, and there are children imitating him back at home. So here comes little Anaximander, and Anaximander comes running in, and you say, that's not polite, what does Homer say? And Anaximander responds by saying, Socrates says Homer was an idiot, and we should question what Homer said, and how do you know that's right anyway, and what do you mean by polite? So you could imagine that the average person thought of this as pernicious, as interference. Here's this dirty, disheveled character, this bum, who doesn't even hold a job, spends all day asking these kinds of questions, teaching the children to mimic him by asking these kinds of questions. And so there was frustration with that, and that's where the corrupting the youth charge comes from. But there was also the charge of not believing in the gods of the state the Greek gods of Athena and Zeus and etc. And this stems from an interesting side digression which I'll mention. So Socrates was famous for having a daemon. <coughs> Excuse me. Socrates famously said that he had a daemon which is a Greek word which later becomes our English word demon. Um, but in the Greek you had good daemons and bad daemons. They were it was sort of just a generic word for these kind of uh, creatures. And so um, in later on in Christianity these become angels and demons. So we could it could just as well be interpreted that uh, Socrates had a guardian angel of some sort. And that's the usual way that it's interpreted. And the daemon was a little voice that he heard in his head which always told him when he ought not to perform some action. So famously, Socrates tells this story where he takes a certain route home every day, and one day he's taking that walk home down the street, down you know Zeus Lane and Athena Boulevard, and he hears a voice in his head which says, take a different way home today. For no reason, out of the blue, he decides to take a different way home. He discovers later that at that time on the normal street, a herd of animals had escaped their pen and had stampeded down the street and had killed someone. And Socrates himself would have been killed if not for the voice of the daemon. So th this is something he tells people that he hears this voice which tells him when he ought not to do something. It's a kind of warning voice. It never tells him to do anything. So it's not as though he hears voices that say, go argue with this person. But rather, he hears a voice which says, don't do that. So they charge him then with denying the gods of the state and invoking his own personal god, this daemon. So the, these charges are kind of trumped up. Socrates goes to trial on these charges and gives his defense. And the defense is famously called the Apology. Because of the Greek word, apology means to defend. So it means something different than what we mean in modern English by apology, which is to apologize, to say you're sorry. Um, it means something very different. So he goes to court and he offers his defense. He questions his accusers. He presents evidence. He, he tells people not to confuse the actual Socrates with his image as his reputation in the society. That each person has a reputation which doesn't accurately reflect who they really are and that you shouldn't confuse the two. He refuses to bring his children and wife in. He has children, he has a wife. It was common in these proceedings to parade them in front of the court, crying and lamenting, please let him off, please let him off. Socrates says, I won't do that. Now what he presents as his defense is some of these ideas we've been discussing. He says, look, the unexamined life is not worth living. You Athenian citizens, whom I love so much, you have been living unexamined lives. You've been sleepwalking through life. Wake up, Athenians. He compares himself to a gadfly. A gadfly is a kind of fly that lands on a horse and will bite it, and the horse will then be goaded out of inaction. So a horse is sort of lazily sitting in the sun. A gadfly comes and bites it on the ass, and the horse oh, starts trotting around being active. Socrates compares himself to that. He says, you're like the lazy horse. I'm like the gadfly. I land on you. I bite you in the ass. I show you that you don't know anything. And then I goad you into action. You become awake. You start walking around. And you start asking these questions for yourself. Now notice what he's doing here. It's very interesting. What he's saying is that his defense is that he's done something for the Athenian citizens. 
he's woken them up. So his defense is, look, I did you a favor. Well, this angers a lot of people, and so we won't go into the details, but he loses the trial, and it's by a relatively close margin. They had hundreds of jurors uh, back then, not 12 like in our day. So he loses by a very narrow vote. I don't know the exact numbers, but if I... But if I recall correctly, it's less than 100 votes or something. I think it's like 80. I, I'm not sure. I won't actually commit myself to saying. I should know this, but I don't. So he loses by a very close margin. So he is convicted of corrupting the youth and of believing in gods, not of the state. And then the second phase of the trial begins, whereby they consider sentencing. So they consider various sentences. Um, and really what, again, what they want is for him to stop acting this way. And he's very defiant. He says he won't quit. So they say, look, if you're not, he says, I can't stop doing this. And as a, uh, we'll see as an instance of this. In fact, he, he really probably can't stop doing this because even as he's on his way into the courthouse, that's where he meets Euthyphro. He stops to have a lengthy conversation with Euthyphro before he goes into the courthouse to defend himself. So that's kind of analogous to committing the crime you're being charged with on the steps of the court before you go to defend yourself for committing that crime. Right? He's out there doing the very thing he's in trouble for minutes before standing trial. So this is a portrait of a person who's not going to stop, uh, who sees it as part of their duty to continue doing what they're doing. So then their second suggestion is, hey, maybe do it somewhere else, right? Let's just exile you. You can move to Sparta. You can move to Alexandria. You just get out of here. Leave us alone. Socrates says that that's not acceptable. And the reason is that he's an Athenian. He's lived there his whole life. He's not going to be exiled. He's old now. Where is he going to go? And besides which, if he goes somewhere else, he's going to keep doing what he's doing. And then what? They're going to get sick of him and put him on trial? Nope. He's going to take his chances here in his home. So now that's very frustrating. Um, here Socrates saying, you know, that I, that's not acceptable to me. I won't leave. I know I've been convicted, but that's not going to happen. So they ask him, what do you, Socrates, think should be your punishment? And it's very interesting what he says next. Uh, in the Greek society, being a champion of the Olympics was about the highest honor you could have in the society. There were the gods, there were the Olympic champions, and then there were the rest of us down here who could eke out a living one way or another. Now, Olympic champions were treated a certain way in the society as the pinnacle of the society. They were treated uh, to carte blanche in the city. They didn't have to pay for food, for rent. Everything was given to them. And in fact, it was an honor to have the Olympic champion driving your chariot as opposed to, you know, Archimedes BS chariots down the street. You want him driving your chariots. So these champions were lauded and were considered the pinnacle of Greek society and culture and were never made to pay for anything again. They could just spend their days as they saw fit. And when Socrates is asked what his punishment should be, he says that. You should treat me like a champion. I, I'm not, he wasn't good at sports, but rather you should treat him that way. He was arguing you should you should reverse your priorities instead of putting on the pedestal these champions of physical beauty who don't have much mental going on. You should rather prize those who are interested in critical self-reflection and really understanding what's going on with themselves and other people as the height of society. And this just angers people to no end. They go away to vote on what his punishment should come be, and they come back, and it's overwhelmingly, it's no longer close, it's overwhelmingly, he loses, and they sentence him to death. Now, of course, no one really wants to kill Socrates. Everyone is hoping that he will escape in the middle of the night. And so they set the execution for when the ship comes in at a certain time, and they send him to a cell in prison to await. He goes there. He has the discussion, which I mentioned previously, about the nature of the soul and whether you survive your death. His friends all pull in. They come to him. They say, Socrates, we've got money. Your family is worried about you, your wife, your kids. We can pay the guard. He's looking the other way. He's lost his toga clip over in the corner there. And he's going to be looking for the toga clip for the next four hours. It's very difficult to find. We have a boat waiting in the harbor. 
We can get you past the guard. Let's get out of here before they kill you. And Socrates gives a very famous argument that he can't leave the cell because it would be to commit an injustice against the city, against the laws. And he imagines this personification of the laws of Athens saying, hey, Socrates, you followed us your whole life and always have been content to live by the laws of Athens. And now when it doesn't go your ways, you're going to do us violence just because it didn't work out the way you wanted it to. You're bound by the law. You're bound by the social contract. And that's a very famous argument that civil disobedience is wrong. And not everyone has agreed with Socrates there. In fact, Aristotle famously, uh, um, later on, when he gets into trouble with the Athenian courts, he leaves town and they send them a letter saying, hey, Aristotle, come back and stand trial. And Aristotle responds back to them, I won't come back and let you sin against philosophy twice. So not everybody agreed that they should, just because the laws say do this, that means you should do it. Socrates does because he thinks if we only choose to obey laws when they're in our favor, then the fabric of society is going to be in trouble. And that's, again, a very interesting argument, but we won't dwell on it. So he doesn't leave. He stays in prison. The boat comes in. They bring him the fatal hemlock, which is how they execute people in this day. He drinks the poison. He stands up. He walks around until he starts feeling cold. He lays down. And his parting word is to make sure to sacrifice a rooster to the god Asclepius because he's being healed and he dies. Now, this is a very moving portrait of a person who profoundly believed in the things that they were saying. So here's Socrates who's lived his whole life according to a certain set of principles. And no matter what you think of the way he acted or the way he's described as acting here, he's not going to give up everything he's believed in his whole life at the last minute. And so here's a kind of portrait of a person who's fiercely passionate about what they think, thinks that they have the right answer, follows the argument to its conclusion, and also has the courage of their convictions and lives according to that worldview. All right, so that's a little bit of the, to give you some context of the discussion with Euthyphro. So Euthyphro is a priest who is coming out of the courthouse as Socrates is walking into it. So you recall I just mentioned that Socrates was about to stand trial for his life, as it turns out, and he sees Euthyphro coming out. Euthyphro says, oh, hey, Socrates, what are you doing over here? And Socrates again, hey, Euthyphro, what, what's going on with you? Why are you at the courthouse? And he's like, I'm going in there to stand trial. And uh, you're pretty famous for knowing about what piety is. So if you're going to tell me what it is, then that would be a great advantage because they're accusing me of being impious. Now, Euthyphro takes the bait and sets himself up for a big fall by claiming Socrates, if there is one thing which distinguishes Euthyphro from all other men, it is his, Euthyphro's, assured knowledge in such matters. So Euthyphro is saying to Socrates, look, I know what piety is, and I'm willing to tell you what it is. So Socrates engaging in this kind of discussion. So what then is piety? Well, the first thing that Euthyphro says is, look, piety's doing what I'm doing. Well, what is he doing? It turns out that Euthyphro is at the court to report his father for murder. And that's supposed to be a very dramatic and surprising consequence to us ancient Greek people who this story is being told to. Since ancient Greece was very patriarchal and the head of the household was not someone who you reported on charges, especially as the son. The duty of the son was to obey the parent. Even more controversial, the person whose, whom Euthyphro's father was alleged to have murdered was a slave. And in fact, the circumstances are very bizarre. So here's the story that Euthyphro tells. There are these two servants who get drunk and get into a fight with each other. One of the servants murders the other servant. So there's Euthyphro's dad who's got this drunk servant who's murdered the other servant. So he doesn't know what to do, what to do with this drunk, crazy servant. So he ties him up and throws him in a ditch in the back of the property and sends someone into the town to get the local authorities. 
Now, of course, this is a long time ago and takes a while to get into the town and get back. And by the time that this other servant gets back with the proper authorities, the slave has been tied up overnight in a ditch and has died from exposure. So it's froze to death and no longer living. Now, Euthyphro then goes to court to file charges against his father for the murder of the slave. The murder being that he left him out overnight. So Socrates again says, oh gee, you must really know what piety is because nobody's going to go to charge their father with murder. So you must really know. So Euthyphro says, yeah, I, I really do know. So once he finds that out, Socrates says, well, you know, that's not really what I'm talking about because what, it, what I'm interested in is a definition of what piety is rather than an example. So a definition is a peculiar kind of thing for Socrates. A definition is a specification of what it is about the thing you're interested in, which is essential to it, where that's typically a question of what property distinguishes it from other things and in virtue of which having it is the reason for it being that kind of object. So a definition is what all the examples have in common and also the further claim that having that thing is responsible for them being the kinds of things they are. So for instance, this is again, uh, continuing with our theme, something which is very easy to do in geometry. So here's a bunch of, if somebody asked you what a triangle was, and you drew these kinds of three pictures, the three kinds of triangles, well, that wouldn't really be to explain what a triangle is. That would be giving examples of triangles. This is a triangle, that's a triangle. There must be some thing which all of those examples have, which is the reason that you're saying they're triangles. It's what makes them examples of being a triangle. And in fact, that's very easy to give. In the case of being a triangle, it's being a three-sided figure whose interior angles add up to 180 degrees, a classical Euclidean triangle. So we can say what it is. Every triangle has that property. No non-triangles have it. And that's the thing which all triangles have in common, which is responsible for them being triangles. Now notice that second part is important because if you look at these triangles, you might say, well, look, what all triangles have in, in common is that they're blue. Here's three blue triangles. They all have that in common. They're all displayed on this screen in front of me right now. But of course, even though the triangles have that in common, that's an accident. That's not what it is which makes them triangles. So when Socrates is talking about piety, what it means to be pious, what he wants is something like this. What is it that every single pious action shares and which is responsible for those actions being pious? Now, Euthyphro, is a smart guy. He's, ah, I see exactly what you mean. Well, really, so you want to know, says Euthyphro, why it is that what I'm doing is pious. Rather than just say this is an example, you want the attribute which makes it that way. Well, here it is. Being pious is being loved by all the gods. And Euthyphro actually tells a story which is supposed to justify this. In fact, his justification is that Zeus, the father of all the gods, kills his own father. So if you know about this Greek mythology, Zeus has to kill his own parents in order to take the throne and be the king of all the gods. And so Euthyphro says, you see, Zeus approves of going against one's father. But of course, there's a problem. And here again, we see Socrates using this methodology of identifying a contradiction. So what's the contradiction? Well, there are many gods, and some approve and others don't. So suppose that Zeus loves action A and Athena hates it. Well then, if being loved by the gods is what makes something pious, then this action is both pious and impious. So that shows that it can't be the right theory. It's got to be something else. And we can notice again this pattern, namely that what's going on here is we identify opposite properties being instantiated by this action and that's supposed to tell us that the original definition can't possibly be right. Aha! Euthyphro says, well, all right then. Let's stipulate that the, the really pious actions are what are loved by all the gods. And of course, in um, once you get past 
polytheism and turn to monotheism, then you can just say love by the God. So that's fantastic. And in the modern times, this is translated into something which is known as the divine command theory. So if we switch from talking about piety and impiety and start talking about just in general what makes something right or wrong, good or bad, then the, the divine command theory says that the things that are good or right are that way because God loves or commands those things. So telling the truth is good because God commanded us to tell the truth. Lying is bad because God forbids us to lie. One of the commandments, do not bear false witness. Now Socrates objects that this way of thinking about moral properties can't be right. And this is the beginning of his argument that there are objective moral properties which are not merely relative. And the basic idea is that we can't simply say that what is right is what God loves because we haven't said why God loves that thing. And there are two different ways of understanding that, which leads to what is known as the Euthyphro question, simply because it's the question that Socrates asks Euthyphro at this point in the dialogue. So the question then is, look, take any commandment of God. Say God says, tell the truth. Does God command us to tell the truth because telling the truth is good? Or is it the case that telling the truth is good because God commands it? And these two versions, horns of the dilemma are both at odds with our ordinary way of thinking about morality according to Socrates. Now then, you can see then what Socrates' point is. This isn't the way we think of the loving relationship in common sense. So think about my like of chocolate ice cream. So chocolate ice cream tastes good. Now why does it taste good? Does it taste good because I like it? Or is it that, in other words, so is it the fact that I like it, the reason that it tastes good? Or is it rather that I taste it and then just like the, the taste that I have? So that I like it because of the way that it is already. And Socrates thinks that this is the way we normally talk about love, that you love something because of the way it is already. In particular, for instance, it's creamy, it's sweet, it's got a little bitterness to it, and etc. So the reason that I say that it's good is because of the way that thing is already. And this seems to push us towards one of these answers. So if we think about this, the way that loving works, the object is away already, and we like that stuff about it, and that's what makes us say that it's good. Now, if we take that view, then we deny that it's good because God commands it. So if God looks at the world and says, ah, oh, look, there's telling the truth. I like that because telling the truth is good in and of itself. Well, then you've denied that the divine command theory is true. But on the other hand, if you really want to assert that it's not like that, that instead it's simply whatever God likes becomes good in virtue of his merely liking or loving it or commanding it, then Socrates wants to argue that morality is completely arbitrary. So this is usually brought out by asking questions about, hey, look, you know, what if God came back and said, I command you to rape as much as possible. I command you to murder the innocent. Well, if you really accept the divine command theory, there is no reason to expect that God wouldn't command such a thing. For instance, you can't say, oh, but it's wrong, because whatever he commands is right. And in fact, there are some stories, in, uh, some accounts in the Bible, which seem to support this way of thinking. But it certainly is at uh, odds with our ordinary way of thinking about morality. Some people want to claim that, look, even if God commanded that we ought to rape as much as possible, it wouldn't make it right because there's something about raping which is just intrinsically wrong. So it seems like there's a real problem here. Now, of course, one common response that people give is, look, God wouldn't command such things. We don't have to worry about that because God wouldn't ever say, oh, you know, uh, you should rape. But if you really think that, it's got to be because God's a perfect judge of these things and he sees what's really wrong about rape. 
so he commands us to do that thing. But notice, if you say that, you've already given up on the idea that it's God's commands which make it the case that rape is wrong. It's rather that he sort of looks out into the world, says, oh, raping is terrible. It's a violation of autonomy. Commands us not to do it. And it's this other principle, the violation of autonomy, the causing of despair, and etc., which is doing the work of justifying the moral claim. So what Socrates is arguing here is that there's a distinction to be made between the commands of God on the one hand and the things which are moral on the other hand. It seems as though moral properties are intrinsic properties which don't depend on the relations to the love of God or to the other people, to society. They're, they are what they are because of the way that they are and not because of their relations to other things. And this seems to preclude that they are merely that way because of a relationship to the commandment of God. So here we have one of the first arguments that's explicitly given that when it comes to moral properties, we don't need to depend on divine revelation. Now, if God commands us to do various things, we can accept those as tracking what's real because God is a perfect judge with perfect rationality who wouldn't want to mislead us. And so we can accept that murder is wrong and that, and that telling the truth is morally good. But what Socrates is arguing is that knowing that God doesn't like it doesn't answer the full question yet because we still want to know why doesn't God like it? What is the reason? What's the ultimate source of the justification for saying that rape is wrong and that telling the truth is good. Now notice this is just again putting him in line with these earlier pre-Socratics. Here again we see someone who thinks that we can use reason to discover the way things are in the moral realm and that we don't need to divine uh, we don't need to rely on divine revelation as our only source of knowledge about what's real in the realm of morality. And in fact that um, Morality must depend on something further, something outside of the will of God. Now, so then the summing up, we're coming to the end of this lecture, and I know it's gone on a bit longer than usual, but these are important topics. So where Socrates concludes then is that what he calls goodness is an intrinsic property that some actions or persons possess, and the virtuous person, a good person, is one who knows what that is. In other words, they're able to look out into the world and see which actions exhibit this property, which persons exhibit it, and knowing goodness is simply amounting to knowing what it is that all good things have in common and is responsible for their being good. To achieve that task is the most important goal of human life. And that's where this idea of critical self-reflection, what Socrates says, calls know thyself or the unexamined life, um, as we discussed previously. In order to do that, we need to engage in dialogue with other people to help uncover these things which are innate in us, discovering these truths via the use of reason. So that's a kind of summary of what the historical Socrates is thought to have held. And of course, there are many more details that we could go into.